Hello and good evening and welcome back to Tuesday Night Live here in the Honing Block with me, OC Edge of Four. We have another show for you tonight. I've had a little break. I've had a bit of time. Well, I can't really call it time off because I've been busy with other projects, but I am back with the lives and we have got a number of great guests lined up for you for not just this month, but going into next month as well. A lot of exciting conversations are going to be happening here and we're going to be dealing with the topics that you need to help develop yourself as an entrepreneur, as somebody who is developing their business ideas and your business strategy. Now, tonight's show is all about online learning. We're living in an age now where the majority of the things that we're doing are now online. I think everybody's Zoomed out. We have Zooms for everything, and if you use Microsoft Teams or whatever it is that you use, we are online platformed out. Everything that we're doing is uh, remote. Well, the majority of things that we're doing is remote. But, you know, with all the news and everything coming up in regard to um, education and uh, what's happening with exam results and everything else, it really does beg the question, what is the future going to be for learning in general? So not just the education sector, but beyond that, what about in your professional career? What about continuing pres professional, professional, professional development? What about pr personal development? What about just learning in general? How are you when it comes to learning online? Are you comfortable with it? Is it something that you've always done? Is that your bread and butter? You're used to it. Or are you somebody who struggles with uh, getting your head around just uh, online learning? Or are you overwhelmed by the amount of things that there are out there to learn? And do you not know where to start? Well, tonight we are in for a treat because we have three guests with us tonight and they are going to be talking about this very topic. We're going to get to grips with where to start when it comes to professional development. We're going to be talking about the different tools and different approaches that we should have and uh, 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 thinking about practical steps that we can take to be able to improve ourselves, develop ourselves, get the certifications that we need as entrepreneurs and as we develop in our business. Now, one thing that dawned on me, it's quite interesting to me that, you know, with the rise of technology, sometimes people can kind of find themselves stuck. If they're not up to speed with technology, they can find themselves stuck and it can be quite frustrating. Now, one example of that is the car. You know, the modern day car, there's a lot of technology involved, even just to go forwards and backwards. It used to be that, okay, if you want to drive forward in a car, you can do that. But if you want to operate, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sat nav, or if you want to operate the um, air conditioning, you had to stop and kind of figure it out. Now, it is different. Now, how are you when it comes to digital literacy? How are you when it comes to transferring knowledge of uh, uh, software from one area to the other? All of these things count when it comes to personal development. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in the first guest for tonight and we're going to be saying hello to Mr. Paul Morrison. How are you, sir? Good evening. I am fabulous. Hello, everybody. So yeah, it's an amazing day. Um, just wanted to firstly reach out to all those incredible students out there. Um, shout out to my daughter who picked up their A level results. Um, you know, the government, you know, did a lot. And I don't want to, this is not about, you know, saying about it's, the it's government. Been, let's call it what it's been crazy, right? <laughs> yes, let's not yes. beat around the bush. Yes. It has been mad. It's been crazy. People have but, not known what on earth is happening, and there's been a lot of undue stress. So you said your daughter, um, so did, was she caught up? What level was she at? Is she uh, secondary to A-level or A-level to uni? So she going to university this year. So she was picking up her A-level result, thinking that she was automatically accepted into a university. Right. Um, she picked up her results and they definitely bumped her down. So oh um, she didn't get her first choice, but she got her second choice. Okay. But today she picked up a proper grade mm. and she's now got accepted into both universities. Okay, but the okay. good thing for her, which I've just, you know, a big shout out to her, she decided to stick with the first university. Um, she said, you know, they accepted her 
and then she's going to stay with them. So she's going to University of Nottingham. So shout okay. out to her. That's your hometown, right? That's you my know, hometown. That's, that's, yes. <laughs> so, so, <back> real, <laughs> so you could send uncles and aunties to spy on her, right? Make sure she's all right. <laughs> I think it's more send uncles and aunties to feed her. So. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Feeding and laundry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Well, sir, so good to have you on the show. Um, so I'm going to bring you back in in a moment. We're going to bring in the next guests. So thank you so much. Uh, my next guest on the show tonight, the next panelist, these guys need no introduction. They've been on the show before. Is the one and only Mr. Ronaldo Lawrence. How Hello, are sir. you, sir? I am doing absolutely fabulous, thank you. And I hope you're the same. Excellent. Yes, I'm doing well. I'm alive. Yeah. I am grateful. So, yeah, great to have you back on the show, sir. How, nice how have you. things been from you? Because I know you're still working in schools right now, so it must have been crazy for you, right? It has been crazy for me. Um, it's been crazy for all the kids. Um, but I think the, the, the one thing that has really been amplified for me, and it has sort of been my mantra from here on out the rest of my life, is that nobody really know what they're doing and everybody just guessing at it. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, I'm just going to take my best shot at everything that I do, live my life the best that I can, and get on with it because no yes. one really knows what they're doing. Right. But I will add to that. Everybody pretends that they know pretend. way more than you. Yeah. Everybody does that. Yeah. It's so interesting because yeah. everybody walks <laughs> around with this air of, I know what I'm doing. Every now and again, you have people who um, are kind of, uh, you know, a bit humble and they, they feel like, oh, they, they don't really deserve. They have that imposter syndrome and they feel yes. like they don't belong in this place. And what you're yeah. saying and what I'm saying, because we're agreeing here, actually, Nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> the majority of people. You know what's amazing? If you're quiet for a minute and just listen to people, you can tell they don't know what they're doing. Right. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Very yeah. true. Mm. But yeah, it's great to have you on the show. I Thank appreciate you, you coming Thank back. You. And uh, I'll be bringing you back on as well in a, in a moment. So thank you, sir. Okay, so the last guest on our show today, the last panelist, is none other than Mr. Paul Essien. Good evening, sir. How yeah. are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Thanks Excellent. Good? Yeah, I, I'm well. I'm well. I'm all right. I'm all right. You know me. I'm, I'm a survivor. <laughs> you are indeed. You are. <laughs> I'm a survivor. Yeah. I look much taller than you, though. I, I feel like I should, I should lower my seat or something. I don't know. <laughs> there we go. So, so yeah, how have things been for yourself? Naturally, you're a serial entrepreneur. Um, some of these things, naturally, in terms of um, education sector, don't directly affect you, but there must be some uh, repercussions as uh, having staff yourself, how you're training staff and how they learn, how they develop. Um, uh, just during this time, th things like that must have affected you, or, or has it? Well, yes, it has. I mean, I think more than ever, we, as, I mean, I wear two hats, really. Um, one as an employer and, and the other as, I hate the word entrepreneur, as, as a business leader in that as an, as an employer, I need people that can do things that I can't. And so, you know, in order for these people to be able to do that, they have to be constantly upskilling themselves. They have to stay ahead of the curve. And so it has been, we've been paying more attention to to the, um, the pool of available staff. And we're finding more and more that even for normal jobs, we get applicants that have a master's degree or have seven years experience in this and seven years experience in that. And then in my other, the other hat I wear as a business leader of the problem solve is that the degree to which I can solve problems for others and for other businesses depends on the skills that I have and how relevant those skills are and again, how ahead of the curve those skills are. So even for me, I have responsibility to myself and to my businesses that I'm in a perpetual state of learning. Yes, most definitely. And I think um, from knowing you personally, from the things that you've shared before, I know you're an advocate of uh, the... Uh, self-development, personal development, becoming an expert at what you do. So we're going to get into some of these things in a moment. I'm going to bring everybody back on and then we're going to kick off this um, discussion tonight, uh, which again is about online learning 
and personal development. So I want to kind of attack this from uh, three different angles. Uh, initially, I want us to talk about the personal development side, because I know that there's not a single person here present in this forum that does not develop themselves personally. Every single one of you is an advocate of personal development and you've led by example in your personal journeys as well. So my first question is, where does one start when it comes to personal development? What is the starting point that people should uh, 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 begin at? Because what I find is a lot of people have the intention to develop themselves, but I would suggest there are many unread books, many <coughs> unfinished books out there. You know, a lot of audio books stopped halfway. So where does one start and how do they um, choose the material when it comes to personal development? So we're looking at this from an entrepreneurial perspective, somebody who wants to develop themselves. Can I, can I just jump in very quickly? So um, and I know the top conversation is definitely around online learning, but one of the things I do want to specify here, and, and it's a topic that I love to talk about, is mentorship. And that's really, really key for me because... Lately, I've started um, doing, you know, I'm an investor, but lately I've started um, investing in Forex and I've been looking at every YouTube channel, online books, just just so much stuff that I've been regurgitating, reading. Um, but nothing really beats me. Um, nothing really beats having someone that you can turn to at any point. And even yesterday I was trading and I did I had a fantastic day of trading, really, really good day of trading. And I spoke to my mentor uh, for Forex trading, it just happens to be Ozzy. And um, the first thing he said to me was, just be careful because you've had a good day, but what you did was you kind of went too far with the stakes and that could have been quite, it could, even though it was a good day, it could have been really a, a bad day. You could have lost quite a lot of your investment so just be careful so the first thing i'd like to add is whatever whatever it is that you are looking to um, better yourself in whatever topic whatever subject the first thing i would recommend for anyone to do is find someone who's doing it find someone who's doing it better than you somebody that's got a lot of experience and go and talk to them because you will learn so much from that person you will learn from their mistakes, you'll learn from their experiences, and then you can start to put together a bit of a plan of what you want to do and how you want to do it and in what time frame. So that would be the first thing that I would actually say for anyone looking to invest in themselves to, to start looking at having a mentor. That's brilliant. I love that. I want to pick up on that a little bit, actually, because I think it, it is so key in i guess the first part of my question which is where do they start right mm. so where does someone start so how does that conversation go you found someone who is doing what it is that you want to do um they're doing it better than you you want to learn from how does that how does one approach um someone to become a mentor i find that uh, people I, I i guess from my own analysis is there any kind of empirical study but from my own life analysis i have seen that people in this country tend not to put themselves under people very easily. Uh, I see that more prevalent in other cultures, a lot of other, even on the continent in Europe, it's more prevalent than here in the UK. I think people want to either be on e even kill with people or see someone as a challenge that they have to surpass. You know, they, they don't have that humble, can I learn from you type of thing. So how does that conversation happen in your opinion? Well, there's, there's, there's two, two ways I see this. So the first way is, and it depends on where you are in your journey. So if you're at the beginning of your journey, you can, someone comes to me and says, you know, Paul, I'd like you to be my mentor if possible. Um, now, I would look at the amount of people that I am actually mentoring. So I'll look at all my mentees and think, actually, I don't know if I can take anyone else on. So I would then recommend someone who maybe I mentor, but they're at that position that they can now start to mentor someone else. 
or if you really are taking it serious, and it depends on where you are in your journey, but if you are taking it serious, sometimes you have to pay for a mentor. You have to pay someone for their expertise. You know, it takes, you know, you can, I, I can ask, you know, Paul Essien a question and it takes him five seconds to give me an answer, but it's actually taken him 20 years to gain the experience in order to give me that answer. So sometimes you just got to invest in yourself. And that's a massive thing. You know, if you want, if I want to be um, a Forex trader, I'm going to have to put some money down to say, right, you spent a lot of time in trade, in trading. I need to be able to learn from you. You know, is there a way of me either paying for your service or can you recommend someone that I can actually learn from? So that's what I would do is, is I would just, you know, be willing to sacrifice. Not everybody's got money and I understand that. So sometimes you have to, um, I call it paying into the bank. So you keep paying in. So you've got your network, keep paying into the bank because at some point you will want to make withdrawals. And there's certain people that if you kind of help them with things, if you see that they have a project and you make yourself available to help them, when you need the help, they will be there for you as well. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. I think that is quite helpful. Just looking from both of those perspectives, just approaching people, asking the question, and also just keeping in mind, actually, yeah, I love that um, description that the answer from Paul could be very quick, but he spent years to, uh, in training and development to be able to give that quick answer. I think yeah. that's, that's really important. So, so again, to the, to the, to the um, both of you, Ronaldo and, uh, and Paul Essien, uh, regarding this um, personal development, where do people start? Paul has thrown in mentorship as well. What are your thoughts around that in terms of what people should do? What's your advice? Paul, you want to go in? Okay. Um, I think specificity is important. What I mean by that is we need to have an understanding of exactly what it is that we want, you know, exactly where where is it that we want to go before we start this journey, this journey to work. And I'm not talking about a vision board. I've got no issue with people that have vision boards. But with some of the things we want, we can't just put it on a piece of paper and go and meditate. We have to be active, right? So to do that, for me, it's specificity. We need to start, we need to know exactly what is it that I want. And then I need to find out how to get there because that will inform me on well, what skills do I need to learn. And if I need to learn about coding, for instance, there's no point in me listening to audio books about cooking or, or anything else. It needs to be that specific. So for me, on the journey that I've had, it was first a more general thing, but as I became more aware of what I actually wanted and I was able to focus on what I actually wanted, I was able to find out the skills that I would need to get close to, to that destination and then focus on how do I acquire these skills? Who do I need to speak to? What do I need to read? What do I need to consume? What do I need to know that I didn't know yesterday? And for me, that's the best way to start. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, the, to me, the most important thing is time. And how much time am I willing to devote to, to what I want? Um, and, and as both of you have said is, do you really want it? Or are you just playing? So do you really want what you think you want? So, so, so my sort of list goes like this. First of all, you got to have a purpose. And you got to know what you want. And I don't mean just a purpose where you just think you want it. I mean a purpose where almost sometimes your life depends on it. Um, I think the next thing is, um, as Paul said, you got to decide what you want. And I mean really what you want. And I think that the best thing um, that you can ever do um, as Paul said, is that find somebody who's done what you've done to cut the learning time down. Because you don't need to go through everything that they've gone through, but you can cut the learning time down. And even sometimes if you can just hear what they've said, maybe you can gleam enough, enough to understand what's going on. And then I think the next thing is to sort of find the free options that are out there. You know, YouTube is a monster. YouTube is a monster. Mm -hmm. And there is somebody out there who's always trying to prove what they know. And I am so happy that they're doing it. 
You know what I mean? So YouTube, and I think if you do a search on Google for anything that you're trying to learn, undoubtedly you will find it, um, mm -hmm. what you're trying to learn. Um, and I think that the other thing is Google itself. If, if you're trying to, to learn just about anything, uh, if you go to Google, Google has a whole training program on how to be an entrepreneur, you know, where you can learn how to use social media, where you can learn how to, to sell stuff. Google does everything for you. And it just, it's a bunch of uh, courses at the end. All you need to do is just take an exam to pass, you know, and it's amazing and it's all free. So I think, you know, I think that main thing, what the other two gentlemen said is, man, you got to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. you know, my grandmother used to say to me, if I'm going to, my grandmother used to say to me, we have a town called Columbia, which was about 45 miles away. She said, if you're going to Columbia, well, will you just get out there and start walking? She said, no, you need to find out, you need to have a map of where you need to go. And I think that's the first thing, have a map of where you need to go. That's really good. I appreciate everything everybody said. The things that come to mind even from my own personal experience, because I kind of treat online learning and uh, personal development um, kind of like Neo from the Matrix. So I have a need and I plug myself into the Matrix and I'll just kind of blink and then, and then I know it. That's, that's the idea. It's not that fast. It's never that fast. But that's, that's, that, that's always my aim. I have something that I need to do. Oops, I don't know how to do it. I need to learn everything that I need to know in order to get to know how to do this thing. So that's how I end up being able to play instruments. That's how I end up, you know, working in education sector. That's how I know things in technology. That's how I know. So there's lots of different things. It's what, what do I visualize? What is it? So that vision, I resonate with that a lot. My question is validity, especially when it's free. How can people validate that the information that they're looking for is valid in the person that's presented, especially with an open platform like YouTube, where anybody can get up and prove them, say that they're an expert in something. And, and I think, not, not to labor on the point, but the point that uh, Paul made before about um, Forex, I think that is a very powerful example because actually, in terms of the foreign exchange markets, everybody's an expert <laughs> that, you know, they put themselves on YouTube and how do you know, and, and not just that as an example, but there's so many different areas. Naturally, there's certain things that's easier than others to know. For example, if you're teaching someone how to cook and you have cooked that thing, you know that it's a valid source. Other things aren't so measurable. So they could be giving you advice that this is the best way to do such and such. And you don't know that that is the worst advice ever, but you're looking for information. How does one vet the information that they find when it comes to free searching? Well, personally, I just think that it depends on what you want to do. Um, if I was going to invest in investment, I would never trust the web as to tell me what to do because that's a whole other area. But if I'm trying to learn stuff that's going to help me to develop the skills that I need to, say, teach, or I need to, say, create spreadsheets, or I need to say stuff like that, then I think the web is a very viable option. Um, but I think common sense has to come prevail at some point in time. And so if I was doing Forex trading, there's no way I'm going to jump on the internet and say, okay. You know, and a classic example, man, is that um, my wife signed up for something and it was Forex trading. And she didn't realize exactly what she was signing up for. And the amount of emails and the amount of time that they've sent her email on to somebody else to try to get her to do various things. And it's not an easy thing to do. It takes time. Mm. And so, again, going back to the first thing I said, time. You have to be prepared to invest the time to learn. And even if you do learn, people still get robbed. <laughs> you know, people still get robbed. So I think it depends on what you actually want to do. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Sorry, but yeah, I totally agree. Um, and this is back to why I was, at the beginning I was saying about mentorship. Because sometimes you, you just don't know. You know, I, there's some people who are really quite convincing. You see them and they say, hey, guys, I'm rich. I've got lots of money. Follow me. I've got the strategy. You paid £20 a week. And guess what? I'll help you. You pay the £20 a week, £100 a month, whatever it is. And they don't know how to help you because they're great salespeople. While there's some people who have been there, they've bought the T-shirt. You know they've lost 
money. They want, they know what they, they know. And they just, and so when you go and talk to those people and they say, right, I think you should be doing this. They know why you should be doing it because they've experienced it. So this is why I think um, I'm very much about learning from others rather than just going to do it myself. And obviously the things you've just got to do it. You've just got to get up off your behind and you've got to, you know, put the time and effort in. But you also have to find people who have got the skill that you can learn from. And that's kind of what I, I think is really important, learning from others. Thank you. Um, oh, so this is a great question. Um, and I've, I've spoken about this with a few other people before. Mm. I believe that the age of the polished guru should be over. It isn't. You know, the guy with social media pictures in front of a private chair with a six pack and a perfect wife. And that tends to be enough to get people to sign up and, and give them money for their expertise. That age should be over. Um, but it isn't, because what that is, is an attempt to acquire overnight credibility. And, you know, it's, it's hard for genuine people to establish that credibility in against the backdrop of such noise, of such vacuous behaviour and headlines and, you know, the mass appeal on social media and elsewhere. But fundamentally, this session tonight is about learning and learning itself is about acquiring the skill of learning. This is why you have bankers and lawyers that studied history of art at university. It's not that you have to study law or finance at university to get into finance. Your degree or your college education or whatever is just proving to your employer that you know how to learn. Mm -hmm. right? And the process of learning is about critical thinking. It's mm -hmm. about receiving information and challenging it. It's about, well, can I find a second or third resource that supports that? Well, hold on, this resource contradicts that. Why does it contradict that? Where's the empirical evidence? Where is more data? And, um, you know, I, I read something the other day that said, um, in God we trust, all others must show data. And <laughs> I think that's a powerful statement. And no matter what you're trying to learn, whether you're a newbie or not, the onus, the responsibility is on you to establish the credibility of what you're consuming. Mm. Now, a point Ronaldo made on the last question was about the amount of time you're willing to deploy. Now, if you're willing to learn, that means you're trading your time for your attempt to acquire more information. So it is incumbent on you to make sure that the information you're trying to attain is valid. And that may mean that you have to kiss some frogs. That may mean that you have to check it out three times, four times from different sources and find out why there is a difference in what these people are saying. That may not mean that one person is lying and that another person isn't, but there are nuances in every business, in every field, in every skill. And it is incumbent on the person attempting to learn, if they have a true desire to learn that skill, that they test what they are hearing and do not just take it from whoever has the shiniest teeth and the best photos on social media. The other thing there, man, I think is very important, as you said, um, someone, someone mentioned before, is that, you know, sometimes free is not the way. Sometimes free is not the way. Like you said, Paul, Mr. Morrison, free is not the way. And sometimes you have to pay for what you want. And um, it, it's quite interesting because um, my wife bought some lights for my daughter's bike, and they were very cheap lights, and they fell off. Yeah. And it's the same thing with life. You pay for what you really want. Yeah. And if you go cheap, you get cheap, you know? And so that, that that's how I look at it. But I use YouTube as a starting point. Mm. Um, I, I use YouTube as a way of the, the sort of entry level point. Um, like for instance, I'm now, um, I've just bought me a Yeti mic. So I know nothing about Yeti mics. So over the last, say, two weeks, I've been looking at this mic. And I've been looking at all kinds of videos about this mic. Now, undoubtedly, I've got an idea how to use that mic, but you can believe this. When that mic comes, I'm going down to Guilford. I'm going into a store where somebody can look at me, and I can look at them with masks, and I'm <laughs> going to ask them, look, how do you use this? 
because I want somebody physically to be there to show me how to do the right thing. And I, and I think that that's a lot, you know, like um, like you guys say, man, you can try and do whatever you want to do. But sometimes it takes a mentor, somebody physically in front of you to say, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. That experience is a monster. You know, you can burn your hands a lot of times. But I guarantee you, if you burn it enough, you're not going to burn it again. This is all good stuff. This is all very good stuff. I think that for somebody who is watching this now, thinking and considering where to start. I think there's certain rules that have come out of this now. So don't just rely on the free resources that are out there. Do your due diligence and find out the sources of the, that information. Be prepared to pay. Um, and also, I think that that kind of, the, the last point that you just made, Ronaldo, I think that, um, yeah, that's something that I do quite often, if, especially if it's something that I've come across I'm not too sure of. I will try to find advice online and then more advice and then a bit more advice. And I'm looking for contradictions. I'm looking for similarities and I'm kind of honing in. I mean, let's put this uh, uh, into context here. We've got somebody who, let's say they bake. They are uh, baking cakes and somebody asks them to bake a cake for their wedding. They bake a cake for the wedding. Everybody loves it. They say, oh my goodness, you should do this for, for a job. So they then start to think about starting a business as a baker, but they don't really know anything about business. They don't know where to start. You can go online and all the things that we've just said are things that they should follow. Now, when it comes to figuring out at the early stages that the information that you're receiving isn't helpful for you, it's not as easy. It's not as easy because they don't know anything at the early stage. They really don't know what is for them. For example, they could be listening to business advice that is specific to a certain sector. It's not specific to the sector that they're in. It wasn't blatantly obvious from the beginning, but as they continue to go on, what does one do when they're in a situation where they've started a book? They're halfway through the book. They're like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. They've maybe tried an online TED talk or whatever, and, and they keep coming across this information that isn't fully helpful. A lot of people give up. A lot of people stop and naturally we could talk and that would go towards resilience and whether they really want it in the first place. But but for that person who has been misinformed, whoever it was, however it was, they've been misinformed. How do people in the middle of things, it, are there kind of things that people can do that would be kind of general across the board, helpful tips to look out for when you are looking at information so to know right you check this that and the other and that will help you to find the right book so just a, a, a small example before i frame the question throw out to you is the fact that you know the bandwagon of books these self-help books one person reads it they enjoy it it's fantastic so they tell somebody else they should read it but maybe that's not the book for them yeah, this is the type of thing that I see happens quite a lot. So this kind of vetting process while you are consuming the information, how? How does one uh, 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 action that? Okay, so is the question, are you asking, is there a checklist that we can proffer to somebody attempting to learn that yeah. they can follow a certain Yes, and this could come from your own personal experience because I think everybody here has come across things that you're like, no, that is not for me. And then you will, you know, get rid of it and move on. At what point do you, when do you realize that? And yeah, what steps do you take to find that thing that, that is relevant? Just, just jumping in. So in my experience, there's some people, I call them microwave people. So... Mm. They want things quickly. And with the microwave, you put something, you press a button, two minutes later, it's hot. And sometimes they will see, you know, amazing food out there. And they think that they can have that quickly. And there are some times you have to just take your time. And I think the reason why a lot of people give up is more because it's hard. 
they give up because they probably didn't have a plan but the fact that even if they had a plan there comes a point where you just have to really put your mind to it and i i love cooking um for those who know me I'm, i'm a bit i i'm I really, really yeah. <laughs> amazing. You should try my. I need to check out his Instagram other. pictures. I'll tell you something. Make the mouth <laughs> water. I this know, guy, I'm, we, I'm so mad that, man. You need to, you need to uh, get cooking for us now before you mention this again. You're not allowed to mention it again until you cook for all of us. But now, go. <laughs> so, so I love to cook, and one of the things that I've started to do is look at. Okay, so I want to come up with new ideas. And so when you come up with new ideas, what I started to do is look at cookery books. And some of the cookery books that people say are good, when I read them, I just don't get anything out of it. I go onto YouTube and I just Google um, loads of different ideas and I'm taking a little bit from everywhere. But what I realized that sometimes I have to just get the ingredients and really start to look at what goes well together. Why does it go well together? If I add this, what, and I have to start to learn myself. And what, what I'm trying to say is there's some things, yes, you can get advice from you know, people who've done it a lot, get yourself a mentor, all of those things, pay for a mentor, get one who's been kind enough to give you all their time and effort. But if you don't put your time and effort into something, I don't care, I, I don't really care, you never complete it. You'll never finish that book. You'll never start that business. Um, so that's the first thing. But also, I, I, as part of my cooking experience, what I'm not is I'm not good at, if you give me a wedding cake, I'm never going to be able to do the tears and the icing. And there's some people that do it so much better. So I think some people also need to know what is it that you're called to do? What is your calling? What is it that you want to do? Maybe you've got a business idea, but you're not the person to start that business. You need a business partner to help you to execute that idea that's in your head. So my view is you have to almost say, right, start from scratch, write a plan, write a plan of what you want to do. So put in your satellite navigation system of where you want to go, how you're going to get there. But most importantly, who's going to help you to get there? Once you do that, you realize that some of the things that maybe you're trying to take on, the reason why you're not finishing the book, you've got the idea, you know what you want to do, but you are not the person to type it because you can't get it down quick enough. So you might have to find someone like a shadow or ghostwriter to help you. So my view is get it down on paper and know what your limitations are, but also know what it is that you want to achieve. Great. Brilliant. I like that. I like that. Any other thoughts, gentlemen? Paul? Um, oh, all right. So I think I've, I, I, when I speak to other people now, I try to remember that I'm speaking to them from a position where I have disposable income and time. And I found in the past I've taken that for granted. Um, after one of your recent sessions, I was like, yeah, if anybody needs any help, give me a call. That's what people call, you know? And then I was speaking to somebody and I was like, okay, I spoke to them about their targets and everything. And then it was very specific. And I was like, okay, this is great. Look, so in the morning, call your legal team and get them to draft. You know, like, I, don't, I don't have a legal team. Um, We'll call your accountant and get them to, I don't have an accountant. You know, I, I'm still remembering that before we start giving advice to people on how they go forward with me, I need to take myself back to when I was flat on my face and I needed to figure out how to put petrol in my car, right? And then I think about how I can advise them on a checklist or how to start or how to fail quickly or how to finish this or that. So it still for me starts with what you want. And then I assume that you have no safety net, you have no money, you have no income. So then it is, who are you? When I say who are you, what skills do you already have? Who's in your phone? What resources do you already have? Because for instance, if you want to get into property and you don't have the money to pay for a builder, 
but you have a relationship with a builder, well, you can get more favorable terms than that builder will. You can use your relationship with currency to get that builder to start the work and you can pay them when you drop down the next piece of money. You might be able to do that if you don't know a builder. So I'm just saying, in terms of a checklist, for me, I advise people to say, okay, again, what do I have? What am I good at? What am I bad at? What people do I have? What natural resources do I have? Do I have access to? That's the first thing. And then even in regards to the books, not everyone enjoys reading. You know, myself, I'm from a demographic where things like dyslexia was massively underdiagnosed. I know people in their 30s and 40s that have just found out that they have dyslexia. Right? And so maybe audio books are better for them than a normal book. And that may seem like a small thing, but that can be massive when people say, well, I just can't get into this book, right? But then also, maybe they work three jobs. So they can't sit down and read that book, but they can have their headphones on and consume that information in a way that's more appealing to them, in a way that allows them to see that through, rather than even it affecting their self-esteem in that, well, maybe I'm just a quitter, maybe I'm not that person. But it is important, again, to identify what skills you have, because of the point that Paul just made is that you know, you may not be built for every part of the business that you need to to bring into fruition. On some of my businesses, I have a business partner that's great at everything I'm terrible at. And there's lots of things that I'm terrible at. Now, that allows us to build infrastructure around my weaknesses that protect our business from my weaknesses and from my weaknesses. Right? Now, your business partner may not be your best friend, but it may be something that people need to establish by looking through what you have, who you have access to, what skills you have. I think that's the first place to start checking internally before you start learning about well, who should I be speaking to, what books should I be reading. Let's look at your natural status where you are now. What do I have? What don't I have? What can I get for free? Who can I call? If I call them, they'll pick up the phone and by virtue of our relationship, I will get my hands on this resource or I'll be able to get my foot in the door on this. And it may seem basic, but every single business I've ever started, every business I'm in now, this is how I start. The first page is my one. Who do I know? What can I have? And I start from there. I think, um, I, I think what you said just now is, is, is imperative. And I think the self-reflection thing. Yeah. And, but being honest with yourself. And I think that's the hardest thing that people find because people fluctuate in terms of what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And I think it's finding something that, you know, you got your heart set on that you really want to do. And the other thing I think is, um, from Mr. Morrison, I think is, is, is purpose. And then find your lane. Find the thing that you really want out of life and try to pursue that. You know, man, when you guys talk about this, all I can think about back when the time when I was a PE teacher and um, I couldn't even spell the word computer. You know, but I saw something one day and I just decided that's what I want. And I can guarantee you that I went home at night and I wrote down everything that I wanted from that. You know, and so I think a lot of us now, what we need to do is really make a decision. And I think the hardest thing for people, because when it gets difficult, people quit and then they look for the next thing. And if you're going to make up your mind, you know, now I'm not saying don't be silly if it's not working out. I'm not saying you don't quit. But what I am saying is that make sure you give it a good go, you know. Can I just say one other thing, man? Every uh -huh. time I come on this podcast with you guys, man, I learn so much, man, that I just run away. I just think I don't know anything. And I just, I just, I just it's true. I do. And I just, the, the amount that I glean from you guys and just the common sense of things is just phenomenal. And then all of you black men sitting here, I just want to say what an honor it is. Sorry, I didn't mean to divert off, but I just want to say what an honor it is. Thank you, Renato. Mm. Thank you. Much, much appreciated. But I can guarantee you one thing. I know the least out of everybody here. I don't this, know this, about this, that. You don't have to worry oh, about that. Bro, you don't bro, don't worry about that. Bro, you're the orchestrator. <laughs> so, <laughs> you like this. You like this. You might know the least of what you don't know, but I know I know nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, boy. Listen. Everybody has contributed some excellent points here. And I think there's really great the, the, the practicality of it. And this is why I frame the question the way that I do, albeit my super long questions as they are. But 
it really is all about people having these practical tips mm -hmm. that they can follow to help recognize in themselves what it is that they need to do to improve and develop in the most effective way for them. So like you said, Paul, you know, uh, uh, Paul e, um, it may be an audio book that's needed. You know, it may be uh, a Paul M, um, somebody who's talking to them directly as a mentor that's actually guiding them, saying, do this, do that. You know, with each step, you know, it is about just actually doing something. And, you know, Ronaldo, your story is so powerful. Like you said, from a PE teacher, you just buried yourself in the library and you just read and read and read. And then you did as you learned as well. So you put it into action. Um, I want to move on to the second point. And the second point is around um, CPD. So continuing professional development. So this is both in the sense of somebody who is an employee and also someone who is not an employee because you can still develop yourself as a professional, you know, in, in, in any area. You don't have to be linked with a workplace. Um, but, yeah, is it effective? Like, the, it, it, in this environment right now, we're moving, because prior to the pandemic, there were questions around the effectiveness of CPD. Every company, every business, they have money set aside for CPD. Now, I remember, you know, teacher training sessions in school, okay? They were the, ch they were the time when <laughs> a lot of the adults chose that this is where they disengage. This is where they switch off. This is where they wind down. They get the phone out. Yeah, exactly. So the effectiveness of it when it was normal was questionable. Now we're talking about potentially moving these things to online, the comfort of your own home. You're having the same CPD sessions. Like, for example, there's a, a college lecturer who, who I spoke to the other day. They're starting um, uh, teacher training, uh, I think, next week on Wednesday. They're starting teacher training. And they've got two whole days from morning till, till late afternoon uh, online CPD. Is it effective? Is it going to work? Is this what we should be expecting for the future of CPD? Is this how people are going to be developing themselves? Um, what are your thoughts on that in general, first of all? So, so from my perspective, and, and for those who are not in education, so CPD, continued professional development. So mm. I think if you're not um, developing yourself, if you're not using the resource, then you're missing a trick. Uh, I think Ronaldo said at the very beginning, there's so much out there free of charge. Um, what I would actually advise is, um, so I've, I've, there's, there's two types of people. There's those who are the jack of all trade. They learn lots of things. And then there's those who are really owned in on being a professional, a master of something. And I think Nowadays, you've got an opportunity to choose between which one you want to be. I prefer to be that master of something, specialize in something. So most people will know me from education technology. I work in the education sector, technology. I work for some of the larger organizations, the Microsoft, the Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And that's what I specialize in. So when I go and talk to another organization about what my skill sets are, um, I can almost, I don't want to use the word demand, but my background will allow me maybe to be able to go in into an organization at a higher level because of the experience and the training. So for, 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 for what I think is, if you're not doing that CPD, you're missing a trick. And before it used to be, do it, do it or don't. But I think now you have to learn. There's so many different ways to learn, Paul, as you mentioned, you know, Audible, there's YouTube, there's various courses you can, there's LinkedIn Learning, the Microsoft's got a load of free resources, Google has got free resources. Um, I think you're in a position now where you have to learn, you have to be doing personal development. Paul, can I jump in for a second? Can I just say something, man? See, you and I take the, the exact opposite points of view. Because I remember when being a specialist was the thing, and people had specialists. Mm. And I 
am a jack of all trades. Because if I was a jack of all trades, I wouldn't have the job that I got done. Because I'm able to do quite a few things in the technology space around education. And I think it's everybody in terms of what type of career that they want. And my sort of path just led me to be somebody who I need to know about the Microsoft side. I need to know about the Adobe side. I need to know about the Texanist side. I need to know about the whatever side. Because we, in education, we use so many different types of, and this is what, this is what I'm saying, by going back and knowing what you want to do, you know, and by knowing what you want to do, you can then find out the areas that you need to study in. Mm -hmm. But I think now, man, what I've. Well, now they, I think okay. he's Yeah, freeze frame. I think he'll be back in a moment. There must I'll, be some connection. I'll, I'll, you go ahead, Paul, yeah. Okay, um, so it's the only non-teacher on the screen. Um, thank you, Paul for explaining what the CPD actually means. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> obviously, I'm just to the topic, actually, because that true story I've had. I don't know what is this about. But actually, um, continued professional development is essential anyway in mm. every field of our lives. In every decision we make, it's based on the information that we acquire when we're about to cross the road. It's dependent on whether cars are coming or not. We then make a decision, we then take a course of action based on the information that we acquire. In every walk of our life, every subsection, we acquire information. Why, Why on earth would it be different with how you feed your family, with how you obtain your health. We have to be in a perpetual state of learning, whether that is an employer, an employee, or a business leader. And we have to remember that everything we do is around solving problems. Now, again, I've spoken and people think I'm, I'm putting this entrepreneur hat. No, forget that. If you are an employee, you solve a problem for your employer. Your employer is your biggest contract they're your biggest client the, your ability to stay relevant your ability to solve that problem only lasts and it's only successful to agree to which you understand the problems of your client of your employer those problems may shift every employer on the planet now has a different dynamic that they're dealing with COVID-19 plus everyone stopped talking about Brexit right now these are massive paradigm shifts. What are you doing to learn more about your industry and the problems of your employer so that you are better placed to solve them? So whether it has, you know, um, like a synonym or these abbreviations or not, what we are still talking about is our responsibility every day to upskill, to stay relevant, to stay sharp, whether that is as an employee or as an entrepreneur. But either way, we are doing this. Solving a problem, sending an invoice for a solution. And to do that consistently, you have to be able to acquire the knowledge about the customer, acquire the knowledge about your industry, acquire the knowledge about the specific issues that are faced by your clients so that you can provide the solution. So, either way, constant learning and solution. I think it's even more relevant. I see we have Ronaldo, but we're going to come back to you, sir, because I know you dropped off in a second, but uh, a second ago. But um, the relevance and importance of that continual learning mm. and continual development, I think it's most more important now than ever. Absolutely. Just in a sense that not just okay solving problems because I need to uh, get a promotion. Actually, you may need to keep your job because there are companies out there that are struggling, ready to let people go because they're cutting back on costs. And actually, they're going to have a look at the staff force and say, right, who is most valuable to us? Mm -hmm. Who can we not do without? And I think that whole development side, you know, I think we are coming out of the days where people will be just twiddling instead of learning because actually those twiddles could cost you your job. But Ronaldo, you, you were making a point before. It was it was a great point, but then I think we lost the connection. Yeah, what, what I was saying was that um, what, what I've done and the way that my career has gone is I've had to be a jack of all trades. Um, and what I did was I sat back 
and I looked at what was happening in my school, pretty much of what um, Mr. Mr. E said there. I looked at what was happening in my school, and I looked at the need that was there. And so when I started, um, when the young lady <laughs> said that she was pregnant but no one knew, and she gave me X amount of time, um, what I did, man, was I went to every single department in school and asked them what if they could have an internet side or internet side, what would they have? So I was trying to, I had sort of saw the problem. I then would do the solution behind the scenes, um, but I had no idea what the hell I was doing. So I went to the library every single day for literally for a year. And so what I did was I created the solution and presented them with the solution to the problem that I saw coming. Um, and I think that's what has to happen now is that everybody now, instead of looking at your job as a job, you have to, like Paul said, you have to try to look into the future and see what that employer might need in order so you can combat what they might need before it happens. Uh, we're living in a different world now. We're living in a world now, man, where if you can't go beyond the call of duty and if you can't do more than one thing, unless it's a really specific role, like you said, your job might be in trouble. And there are so many employees, employers now are just letting people go. You know, mm -hmm. so, so what are you doing in order to make sure that you're not going to be one of those people? A lot of the companies, just jumping in, a lot of the companies out there now, especially the bigger organizations, are operating on the 80-20. So they, your, your day job is 80% of your responsibility, but then they're giving you the 20% to go and find projects within your organization to maybe fix problems, maybe to learn other ideas. And the idea is those 20% of your 20% of your time that you spend doing other things within your organization, that's part of your CPD. That's part of learning about what's in the future. What are some of the problems that you can um, look at and maybe pro provide solutions to those problems? So you're, you're absolutely right, Bernardo. It's so important that, that you don't only just do your day job, but you also look and see what's going to be happening in the future. So I totally agree with you. And you okay, know what's so crazy? Good. What, what, sorry, go ahead, Ronaldo. Go ahead. You, uh, you know what's crazy? If you actually look in the organization, there are so many ways that you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's just say you've got some new employees, why not be the person that say, okay, I volunteered to take these few people aside and teach them how to do this because they're just coming to the organization. And you have to forget about the being paid for things sometimes to start with. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to show value first. And when you mm -hmm. show that you're valuable to the organization, then is when the organization will start doing things for you. Now, I'm not saying that you do it all in secret, but what I am saying is that you have to provide value. More and more now, man, it's about the value that you can you can provide for companies, you know? Okay, so all of these points being made right now, they're excellent points to prove the necessity and validity of professional development. We need it. People need to take it seriously. Now, let's talk about whether it is effective. What about the different ways in which people learn? Is it possible to have online professional development that is effective across the board? Knowing that certain people... If it is just they're clicking play on a screen, self-paced in their own time, let's take for granted now that they are doing it, okay? They've watched this, they've listened to this podcast, and they're saying, yeah, now, from now on, I'm going to be bang on with my CPD. Now, is it going to be effective via an online platform? It depends on whoever's deploying that training and who's consuming it. Now, if the person deploying that training has never had to learn by the same and has never had to face some of the challenges that those that have been embarking on that training will disconnect right there, is there an assumption that the people learning have high-speed internet always have access to the hardware required to learn, that there's no language barrier? You know, it depends on the quality of what's being provided. Now, again, I, I think as a small as a, a small company, it's easier for me to engage with the people that I need to train and see how they're responding to the training. In larger companies, I don't know, but it always seems to me that 
there must be this economy of scale. It must be like so big that it can't be tailor-making the needs of each person that's learning. I remember going to an open day at school, and in the school there were 12 children per class. And in each class there were two teachers, and the 12 girls were split into four groups. And depending on how we did in the first two weeks, they would teach them the same subject by a four different people. Some would learn via the whiteboard, some would learn via an iPad, some would respond to it. But ultimately they were doing the same work. But the class was small enough that the, the training could be tailored to the needs of the child. Not every business can do that. Fair enough. And if some of the people learn, they aren't even able to identify what they will get to respond to. But to answer your question, it really does depend. Like it's a massive question. And it, it really mm. do the specificity to do many and to determine how effective some people will be. But, and then the point I'm sure everyone's going to make it, but then again, it still depends on how badly the person that's learning appreciates the importance of what they're trying to learn and has a desire to apply that information. You know, I um I, I think that you know they're the three learning styles that people tend to th uh, talk about: the visual, the audio, and the kinesthetic. And I think as long as, as the online learning provides for all of those types of areas to learn, because I think sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be just where you are providing online content. You can allow people to download the content, to read on their device if they want to. Um, so I think you know, and with Google now, you know, you got it's a free. So you've got all the content you can put in folders and people can offline the documents or you can read them offline, make comments on them and everything. So I really think like uh, Paul was saying, I think it depends on the type of individual. Um, but I think it, it's important that as an organization that you provide content in all the different learning styles so you're catering to everybody. Absolutely, I just concur with what the guys say. Um, I also think it's important if you are um, some people learn better with other people. So in that case, sometimes you may have to find a learning partner, um, a buddy, someone that you can um, throw ideas. You know, sometimes you read something and you can read it three times and get different meanings every time you read it. But if you've got somebody else who you can then say, look, this is how I've interpreted this. What do you think? And then when you have that, conversation two-way you then start to learn as well so i think that's another important important point that i would bring over paul and sometimes in my cases you read it five times you still don't know what the hell is talking about you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is it i think um like you said there's uh, quite a number of different things that kind of come into play when it comes to the effectiveness of how a particular learning resource, it doesn't matter what it is, how effective that is on the learner, on the receiver. Um, very, very interesting. Okay, I wanna, I wanna come across uh, uh, the, the final point, which is around accreditation um, or certification, uh, because this is becoming increasingly more and more important as well. When you have learned something, how do you prove what you know? Uh, traditional learning, you'd have an online uh, or maybe like the open university you know you know that you come out with accreditation um we know that there are many courses many platforms there's places like udemy where you can sign up for a course you pay for the course and depending on the provider at the end of it you'll get a certificate that actually proves that you know it um there's also things like micro accreditation where you'll do an online course there's a quick quiz at each stage, and at the end of it, you could get a badge or something. And my question is, are they useful? Are they recognized? How far do you go when it comes to this online accreditation? Or is it simply, we need to stick with the traditional route, go to a college, go to university, get a formal accreditation, or are the online ones uh, equally as valid? And I think it depends on what you need, what you want. You know, if you are going for a certain job, then you need specific accreditation. Um, when you work for some of the large organizations like Microsoft, you know, there's so many um, 
accreditations that you can take as part of your role. Um, my view is I think they're important, but it depends on what you want. You know, there's some people who are amazing at training, getting accreditation, but they do nothing with it. And so the, the easiest thing for them is actually doing the training and getting the accreditation. It's, for some people, it's really easy. They just read a book, understand it, take accreditation, and they've got a list, um, their CV is full of all these accreditations, but they've done nothing with it. So my view is with that is look at what you want to achieve, and it's part of that having that plan. You know, there's some jobs that it gives you that credibility by having accreditation why some people are probably not even interested in the accreditation. They just want to know that you can do the job. So it depends on what you want to do with it. Um, with my employer, um, I think, yeah, you know, I have to what policy is in that. You know, it does depend on the role that you're advertising. And sometimes we've not really sought qualifications for certain jobs and other times we said that it would be helpful, you know, I guess even in terms of how internally the application it did weigh more heavily or less depending on the role. I remember um, we were hiring for sales stuff and we had loads of people come in with years of experience and and you know, sales is a hard thing to prove that you can do, other than you know, like selling this product for these illustrious companies for years. And we rented a family office and we had people come in and we had the whole panel thing. We had questions from HR and things like that. And then a lady came in who worked for a charity. So she was one of those people that signed people up outside the train station and get told to go away 500 times a day. Um, the first question in the interview was, what skills would you bring from your previous role that you think is transferable to this role? Which is really saying, like, what is it about what you've done, the dedication or not, that I can tangibly touch in these years? And this is the first question that she said, yesterday I was dropped to a small town called Bakken, near Leeds. Um, at 7 a.m. and I got a coffee from the coffee shop. I walked over to the train station, and and the first gentleman that was walking up to me going into the train station. Um, I approached, and within 40 seconds, I had his bank details and he signed up to give money to the US. That's the shortest interview I've ever had. <laughs> what have you done? What have you done? You're in a working class area with people who are going to work or probably taught themselves in a you know, you're, you're able to close, you're able to get the person to do what you want to them to do at 7 o'clock in the morning, 300 miles away from you. Now, I did not need to see an accreditation. She could have been lying, but the other thing was she knew what I wanted to be. Yes. Right? And that in itself shows a skill. That in itself shows a talent. And no joke, I ended the interview on the higher And so it's not always about what accreditation and qualification you have. Sometimes, again, maybe even I don't value some of the things I see. Because, you know, some of the stuff it just doesn't seem relevant to what I need to do. So, yeah, I think it does depend on the role of the work in the thing. Brilliant. I look at Thank you, Gaston, for that. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Ronaldo. Go ahead. I look at it really. I look at it in terms of education. So I have to have a qualification in order to be in the school. I have to. I have to have, be a specialist in what I do. But I also think, man, that um, accreditation is important. But like Paul said, accreditation is not everything. I think now, man, with the web, you know, you can go on the web, or you can go on something like Fiverr find people who have all these skills and you can employ them for all these skills because you know they can do because they've solved the problem for you. So no longer, you know, do you have to, I think personally, go through all this accreditation stuff if you don't want to, if you've got the skill and you can demonstrate the skill to an employer. And I think more and more, 
you know, I was looking at uh, the show today. Um, I can't remember the show, but um, uh, it's when these employees put on disguises and then they go out into the workplace. Uh, and then they go and they listen to people talk about, because they're the owners of the company and listen to people talk. And it's amazing how if you shut up and listen, it's amazing what you can learn. You know, and sometimes as an employer, all you need to do is be quiet and let people talk. People will talk themselves into a job or out of a job. Fantastic. Guys, uh, we're going to have to wrap this up because the, the time has flown by. Wow. It has absolutely flown by. But I'm not, I'm not going to ignore the people that have been watching online. Thank you, everybody who's been watching. You have some questions coming. And to show my dedication and love to my Facebook friends, because I can't see the messages that come through on Facebook. I don't know why, but I've opened up Facebook on my phone. So I'm going to read um, this one's from Crystal. Crystal's been a guest on the show before. Um, she's asking, are there key skills people should be learning during this time? Are there key skills people should be learning during this time? I want you to think about it. I'm going to read out a couple more. And then we're going to address these um, bit by bit. So are there key skills people should be learning at this time? Um, yes, yeah, she's also mentioned it was a good point that Paul Morrison mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so you may not be the right person uh, to execute a business idea. Partnership may be the best answer when, when you mention it. Um, okay, so students on almost, this is from Anne, Anne Crouch. Students on almost every course uh, now are expected to develop employability skills that they can use anywhere they work. I think that's more of a question than a statement, but that is very true. Um, and we have a question here. I could put this one up. Um, I think this one's around perseverance and resilience. So if you have a dream to do something and you find doors keep closing in your, in your face as the opportunities arise, they, they keep slamming shut in front of you. How do you keep the fire burning towards your dream? Okay, so I think there are two main questions here. Um, what skills, are there any skills that people should be uh, learning right now? And also this question about resilience. So guys, off you go. I think the first thing is learning how to learn. To me, that's the first thing, learning how to learn and, and having a purpose for what you're trying to do. On the second question, I believe that um, if you think that that's your burning desire to do it, then you need to maybe look at the way that you're approaching the problem that you're trying to solve if it hasn't worked out before. And I think what you also need to do is maybe find somebody, like Paul said, find somebody who's done it and go seek out their advice. Because sometimes when we want something so bad, we have blind spots. And I think if you can alleviate those blind spots, then things might come to fruition. Um, on the your question, the first learn how to my session crucial skill now. So Paul, can you speak up a little bit? We can't hear you. Sorry. Um the first thing is learn how to learn as Ronaldo said. And the second thing is can you hear me any better? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. And the second thing was learn how to find problems. It's essential. Learn how to find problems, identify a problem, find out the benefits and solutions, target them, evidence the effectiveness of your solution, then the need. Learn how to find problems. In regards to Wayne's question, I'd say learn how to build your own door if the doors keep coming. And again, this stems from what problem is it that you are trying to solve? Now, if you're thinking about your dream as a business or a task or a skill, sorry, Wayne, you got it wrong. You need to think of this dream and break it down and understand what problem is it that I am trying to solve? Who is it that I'm trying to solve the problem for? Is the person that I'm trying to solve the problem for a stakeholder or a customer? If your dream is to train kids how to be obesity, then your customer isn't the kids. Your customer is the local education authority. So you need to target the solution at the local education authority. When if you start looking at the dream in terms of what is the problem, what is the solution, who needs that solution, who's able to pay me for that solution, how can I evidence how effective my solution is, you'll find that you're building your own goal and you don't need anybody's permission. Yeah, I love it. Um, I think the guys have 
you know, definitely answer the questions. Um, I think the, the thing for me is, you know, sometimes you've got ideas and dreams and you, you, you've, and there's so many people have said to me, you know, I said, you know, do you want to share your idea? And they say, no, because, you know, you might steal it. You know, you've got all these contacts. You might take my idea and, and run with it and you'll be able to execute it so much quicker than me. And actually, you'll find that most people are not interested in copying your idea. So sometimes you have to share that idea and get someone to actually just, you know, your idea may be complete rubbish or it might be an amazing thing. You just don't know if you don't share it. And there's, you know, you, you watch all these programs where people have got ideas and the dragons say, you know, it will never happen. And it does happen. So sometimes you've got to be careful who you talk to because sometimes, you know, people will say it's a rubbish idea and it's a brilliant idea, but you do need to share your idea with someone because then you can start to dissect why it's not working. You know, what could you have done different? Is it the fact that you're knocking on the wrong doors? Is the fact that the idea is great, but you need someone to come in and maybe help you to market the idea? So I would say this, you know, definitely share your idea with someone. And I think in terms of the key skill, I mean, the Paul's already mentioned about finding problems. Kind of on top of that is try to fix problems. If you're a problem fixer, you'll be employed for the rest of your life. If you can see things and it irritates you rather than complain about it, if you try and get an idea of how to fix it, you'll be employed for the rest of your life because that's what companies are looking for is people who can fix problems. That's right. And you'll be paid for the rest of your life as well. So right. Sometimes it's not even someone else employing you, but actually you've solved a problem and people are willing to pay for it. So, uh, guys, this has been absolutely fantastic. The advice has been amazing. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's contributed, the questions that people have thrown in, people watching on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, uh, what have you. Uh, we've got here sound advice, sound advice. And there's some other comments that I cannot put up because they're on Facebook and they haven't come through here. I'm going to have to sort this out. There's a couple of things going to have to sort out for next time, but it's all good. I think we've, we've had a good session tonight, and I think that uh, overall, this should be a very practical session for people to be able to take actionable tips to approach their own personal development and their professional development in a more effective way. I think the overall message tonight is be purposeful, and be driven and i would add on to some of the last points that were made be consistent i think there are so many people who have the same ideas and even if you share it with people and they do steal it and they go ahead and start doing it maybe they do it before you but if you do it and you're consistent it's the perfect execution that will win the race every single time it's not who, it, what was this? It's not who laughs first, who laughs last, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I, I got that mixed up. But the reality is, it's all about consistency. You do what you're supposed to do and keep doing it. Keep doing it. When you don't feel like doing it, do it. When you feel like doing it, do it. When you think maybe you shouldn't do it, do it. Just keep doing it. And you'll see the consistency pays off. But gentlemen, Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Any last words of wisdom? If I'm going to give you each 10 seconds each just to say one final word to everybody as a parting um, uh, uh, piece of advice. So we're going to start with Mr. Ronaldo Lawrence and then we'll move on to the other two. So, sir, any last words for everybody? Uh, I think the last words for me is that please be careful of your self-esteem um, because how you feel about yourself is everything. And when you develop the skills that you need to be successful in whatever role you've chosen, self-esteem plays a big part in that. And I think you believe in yourself. And one of the main ways of believing in yourself is finding somebody who's done what you want to do, see how they've done it, and then you do it your way. But love yourself first. Excellent. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you for, for joining us again. Really appreciate your words of wisdom. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring back in Mr. Morrison. Last 
words for the viewers, please? What are your final thoughts on this topic? So um, if, if there's anybody out there who perhaps have been struggling during lockdown and um, we're slowly trying to get back to a new norm, but if you've been struggling, maybe you're struggling with your mental well-being, maybe those ideas that you thought you was going to birth hasn't happened. I just wanted to let you know there's definitely support and help out there. You know, there's us guys here, um, I'm sure we can either try to help or, or point you in the right direction. But the thing that I would like to leave you is, is having a weakness is not a weakness. And that's what I tell my mentees all the time. Having a weakness is not a weakness. And sometimes we focus so much on our weaknesses and we, we, we beat ourselves up. I just want to say, point, go to someone. There's other people who can help you. And they will have the strength where you have your weakness. And together, you'll be much more successful. Um, thank you for listening to me. It's been, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. Until next time. Thank you. Okay. And last but certainly not least, Mr. SCN, sir. Final words for the viewers, please. Okay, um, don't want to be too philosophical. Um, personal trainers have a term called time under tension, and it, it refers to how muscles grow when they're repeatedly stressed. Now, a lot of people watching this are what I call coming from a place of struggle, and that struggle has meant that we have to find solutions and operate without a safety net, and that's given us some skills that quite simply do not exist in the corporate world. And if you're able to use some of the skills that you develop from your embarrassments, from your misfortune, and shape them into solutions for problems that you identify, I promise you, you'll be able to set your own price. So again, rather than first start looking for other skills, the skills that you develop out of necessity, out of the embarrassments, out of without having to juggle things that maybe you shouldn't have had to juggle. They've developed skills in you that are unique to you, that you can apply to a real world situation, create solutions to which you can name your product. And I think there's a lot of value in some of our scars and some of our mistakes. And I think that's where a lot of us should start. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. And um, until next time, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay, good people. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's show. I hope you have enjoyed it, found it valuable, and you've been taking, taking notes to take action on the practical tips that you were given during tonight's show. I really want you to be able to maximize your potential, develop yourself, take seriously your learning because every single thing that you learn will add to you if you apply it so don't just read the books be the books everything that you are taking in online make sure that you take action thereafter we have got some great interviews coming up next week we're going to be talking to Ola Otaiku and we're going to be dealing with the topic of entrepreneurship so being in a workplace but being innovative in there and maybe having a side hustle at the same time and just being innovative and being entrepreneurial while you are in a job. So we're going to be talking to him about that. We have so many guests. I'm not going to list them right now, but I'll be posting an advert so you can see who is coming up for the month ahead and the months and weeks ahead. Guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you all joining us. Don't forget to spread the word, share these um, videos and uh, like these videos and subscribe to our podcast channel as well because you can listen to these um, interviews on the go. We really appreciate you joining us. You have yourselves a great week and we'll see you next time here on Tuesday Night Live. Take care. Good night.